Welcome to our final interactive leader session of 2012. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Pat Gould, Managing Director of Marketing and Communications at the SOA. If you need technical assistance at any time today, just click the live support button in the bottom left area of your screen or send an email to soa at compartners.com. You can also download the slides by clicking on the download presentation button next to the live support button at the bottom left area of the screen. I'd like to start by introducing the SOA leaders on today's call. We have Tanya Manning, President of the SOA, and Mark Friedman, President-elect of the SOA. Today, Tanya and Mark will talk about some of the highlights from the recent SOA board meeting. They will then discuss the recently adopted revision to the SOA's strategic plan and the 2013 strategic initiatives that were also recently approved by the SOA board. They will then focus on two particular areas in the plan, the SOA's international strategy and some updates from the education area. Finally, we will allow 25 to 30 minutes for questions that you can submit during this webinar, as well as some that were submitted in advance. You can enter a question for us at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question box area and typing your question in that box in the lower right corner of the screen. And be sure to hit the Go button to submit the question. If you don't have a specific question, you can ask us to address a general topic. This webinar will be archived on the SOA website soon. And at the end of today's call, we will ask you to take a very short survey about the session. This will help us learn what you liked, what you didn't like, and what you'd like to see in future interactive sessions. With that, I'll hand it over to Tanya to talk about some of the meetings from the recent board meeting. Tanya? All right. Thank you, Pat. Um, we had our um, last board meeting was in October, and the meeting with the Board of Directors was a very productive meeting. We discussed a lot of different issues, a whole variety, and um, some of them we're going to talk about later in a little more depth, but for now I wanted to give you a few um, items that we discussed and give you some highlights on that. The first is the Enhanced Relationship with Candidates Initiative. This initiative is, first of all, not designed to help candidates pass the exams easier. We're not making the exams easier. What we're doing is we're trying to support the candidates in other ways, however. And we're going to do that by um, giving them access to better information resources, um, giving them more help in understanding how to study for the exams and more feedback on how they did on the exams. And also, really, very importantly, providing a community for them to network with. This, we think all of these are going to enhance our relationship with the candidates so they feel more connected to the SOA and, frankly, more supported. The other thing that we looked at was the nominations process. And this is how we determine who is going to be on a ballot for a board position. Very importantly, we decided at our last board meeting that we are now going to allow a different pathway for individuals to end up on the ballot. Um, in addition to our very rigorous vetting process that we have in place now, we are going to allow nominees um, to attain a place on the ballot through petition. Now, I want to emphasize that we are not taking away the current process of vetting those candidates with the nominating committee. They do a very rigorous review of candidates' qualifications to make sure that we have the best ballot going forward. Um, however, we did um, listened to our members and we had some um, requests and we have listened to that and so we are going to allow folks who want to get on the on the ballots through petition to be able to do so. Um, in addition, the nominating committee, which as I mentioned earlier, is the group that looks at all the possible candidates and people who would like to be on the ballot and goes through that vetting process. Well, this year we began asking fellows to volunteer to be considered for open positions on that nominating committee. And we were very pleased that we had 30 uh, individuals who put their names forward, and we are still going through those individuals and deciding who is going to ultimately be um, filling those open positions on the nominating committee. All right, and um, as I said, we did cover a lot of ground at that board meeting. We went over a variety of issues. I'd say one of the most important things that we did was adopting a new strategic plan for the organization that's going to be in place for 2013 through 2016. Now, your president-elect, Mark Friedman, who is going to go over that strategic plan in just a minute, he actually chaired the task force that developed the strategic plan. He did a great job leading that effort. It was not easy. Um, there was a lot of important decisions and changes, I think, that were re made and were reflected in the strategic plan, and Mark will go over that in a minute. Um, but I also want to thank not only Mark, but all the members who provided input. We had an open period where people could provide comments on what we should do with our strategic plan, and we um, very much appreciate 
all of those comments, they helped us form what ultimately ended up being in the strategic plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark, and he'll talk about what we ended up with. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I, I'm going to talk now about the highlights of our new plan. And you know, like Tanya said, we didn't do this plan in a vacuum. Um, we interviewed many members, we involved the full board, and we exposed the draft to our members. Um, and we listened to your comments. Um, here's my favorite comment, extremely well written, perhaps the best strategic plan I have ever seen. Clear, concise, on the mark, and understandable by all interested parties. Congratulations on a very professional effort. You want to guess who wrote that comment? N no, it wasn't my mom. Uh, it, it actually came from a member. Anyway, um, let's talk about the mission a little bit. The mission spells out that we primarily provide research and education. It emphasizes the role of actuaries as business leaders and advisors. It then focuses on ensuring the integrity and relevance of our most important professional asset, and that's our SOA credentials. Um, the vision shows the SOA as the leading provider of globally recognized actuarial credentials. If you look at our plan, you'll see a ton more emphasis on our global role than what was in our prior plan. It took us about two months to write the one sentence that became our vision. I had a full head of um, dark brown hair before we started this, and look at me now. The education objectives stress that we need to set the global standard for a complete actuarial education and provide global access to it. And we want to foster career-long learning on both technical excellence and business acumen. In our research section, what's new is more emphasis on public policy. In fact, we spelled out policymakers and regulators as new stakeholders. But this isn't the only research we want. We also need practical research, uh, for example, experience studies, as well as research around things that expand the boundaries of actuarial science. On the marketing front, we need to continue to promote the profession among the public and promote the value of our SOA credentials to attract the best candidates. And we want to strengthen existing opportunities and develop new opportunities with employers. We want to grow membership globally, and we want to build and support strong actuarial communities based on professional interests, namely through our sections, and also based on location. And to do all of this, we need money and possibly, more importantly, volunteers. And our plan stresses our organization values, which are integrity, professionalism, professionalism, excellence, and service. If you'd like more details, go to the SOA um, webpage, and you'll go to the leadership session, section, and um, you can see the strategic plan staring at you there. There's a one-page strategy map which lays out all of our objectives. And if you want to peel down more, there are more detailed definitions for each objective. And many actuaries have asked me, um, they've said, that's a nice plan, but how are you going to do all that stuff? And once we developed the plan, we came up with measures we'd like to achieve for each of the objectives. You can view these measures in the same document on the website that contains the objective definitions. Um, but to make this work, we need strategic initiatives as well as a reporting mechanism on the measures that we set. We, we intend to report on both of these elements to you from time to time. And in fact, now Tanya is going to discuss our current portfolio of strategic initiatives. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, that was, um, I think we have a really good strategic plan, and I did not write that comment that you mentioned, but I might have if I thought about it. So I think that that was a very good summary. It is a very good strategic plan. Um, and once you have a strategic plan in place, it's very important that you get the right initiative that begins supporting the objectives of that strategic plan. So we're going to go and talk a little bit about a few more strategic initiatives that we have underway for 2013. Um, what we have listed here are three of them. The first one is the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. They have developed what they have um, named the University Accreditation Program. And essentially what this is doing is it's giving candidates a way, a different way to get credit toward four out of the five preliminary exams. And these are exams that go toward getting an ACIA or an FCIA. And the SOA, we're currently engaging with the CIA. We're talking with them. We're having discussions. 
about exactly how the relationship between the CIA and the SOA should work with regard to education and credentialing of Canadian actuaries um, in recognition of the fact that the CIA has made this decision to allow these university um, courses or these university programs to essentially give credit for what um, the SOA currently requires to be met under examination. The second thing is the SOA's public policy strategy, and you heard mention of that when Mark was talking about our overall strategic plan. Um, public policy is prominent in that new strategic plan because we feel like it is a, we've heard from our members and we agree that it's very important that all of the work that the SOA does, particularly in research, for example, is um, has some impact and, and educates and the people who are making the public policy decisions. So our public policy um, in this initiative, we're going to be determining what the principles should be on how we decide when and how to be involved in public policy and when we choose to comment on public policy provisions. So we know that's somewhere we want to go, but we want to think a little bit more carefully about exactly how we go about having um, that place in the public policy, recognizing that we have a lot to offer with all the information and research and education that we do. Um, the last initiative listed is an expansion into non-traditional roles and markets. And this is also very important. It is um, critical that actuaries continue to have a strong presence in their traditional roles, but find new areas to expand into. And we want them to, um, we're looking at ways to move them into broad non-traditional roles. Um, we're starting out with a financial services market, which makes sense because um, they are very close to the area that actuaries are already currently practicing in. And um, so that's what we're looking to expand into in 2013. Um, here are some more strategic initiatives. We're looking at the framework for the SOA's relationship with other organizations. So as we look at how our organization has relationships with other actual organizations, um, not just in North America, but around the world, um, remember, we're growing as an international organization. We're going to need to have a framework that documents and helps us guide our approach to developing and maintaining such relationships. So who do we partner with in these different areas that we're um, growing and getting new um, exam takers and new members? Secondly, the Internet Intellectual Capital Group is looking at experience studies and what our strategy is there. Um, Producing experience studies is, is a key business role for the SOA and its members. Now this initiative is going to take a step back and say we've been doing experience studies for a while. Let's think about exactly what the purpose of these experience studies are. Who are the stakeholders? What, should, what is the appropriate scope that we should have with the experience studies, especially with the NAIC and the principal-based reserves? Um, that's going to make these experience studies even more important. Also thinking about what competitors are doing and the true value of the studies. Um, are we focusing on the right things? Are we bringing the right things to the table? How is the timing? What is the scope? All of that's going to be considered and kind of take a step back and think about how we can best meet the needs of, the needs of our members um, by producing these experience studies. The next one listed is the learning strategy for the SOA. And this is also, for the most part, taking a step back. We've always been an education organization, but we're looking at what our general philosophy is for education. And this covers both the pre-qualification or when you're taking exams and trying to become an actuary, as well as the professional development, what you need to do once you become an actuary to maintain your designation and remain current in your area of expertise. So we're looking at how things like e-learning should be best utilized, and we're continuing to build learning communities that support both the candidates, the people taking exams, and the members who are trying to learn new areas or interact or grow in their current area specialty. Um, we also want to integrate the SOA's international strategies. That's really important. Um, you'll see that just kind of seeping through in about every strategic initiative we have. Um, so we're looking at that um, and how we should modify or expand what we're doing in the learning area, um, such as making offerings in other languages. Um, finally, we're also focusing on how we can best address the potential reputational risks that we see wrapped around public pension plans. That's something that's certainly in the news. There are a lot of plans that are not in good shape as far as funding, and we want to make sure we understand what impact that could have with actuaries who have been um, part of uh, determining how these plans are um, funded. 
Um, finally, it's not listed on the slide, but I wouldn't. I would like to also mention that we have several operational issue initiatives. Um, many of these are focused on are improving our services to you, our members. Um, for example, we are continuing to redesign SOA.org, our website, wanting to make it easier for the members and as well as the candidates and others to access all of the content that we have out there. We have an amazing amount of content, and we want to make it easier for you to get to what you want and quicker. Um, we're also looking at strengthening the learning management system. This is going to help you build your presentations and business skills. And finally, we're looking at some initial steps to help the SOA become a centralized resource. This is important so that we're um, providing you a, a door, a way, a way, an access point for lots of different types of actual content and not just SOA content. So it kind of connects you with lots of different organizations' content um, through one portal or one access point. Um, so with that, um, another important part of what we're doing, I keep talking about it, the international strategy, but I'm going to let Mark go into more detail and discuss exactly what we're trying to do in the international space. Thanks, Tanya. Um, as I pointed out earlier, one of the major areas we want to focus on is our international needs. And you might ask, why does this matter to you? Well, let's look at our member demographics. Thirteen percent of our members are from outside of North America. Most of that um, is from Asia, is in Asia, um, but 22 percent of candidates are from outside North America. In fact, of the uh, registration list today, everybody registered, there were uh, 19 countries represented uh, in today's call. So we're already a global organization, and we need to service the needs of all of our members. Um, secondly, we're in a global economy. You need to know what's going on everywhere. It's good to understand pension and Social Security issues in other countries. And if you're an actually working in an insurance company in North America, imagine if a Chinese company bought your company. Having a credential that's valued in China will make you more valuable. In the international arena, insurance companies in emerging markets don't always split themselves between life and general insurance. As, as a result, many actuarial students don't want to make an early decision on which track they'd like to ultimately specialize in. Also, many students like the idea of a double major all within one credential. So we want to grow in markets that make sense for us. China is a good example. We already have a strong foothold there. Also, they have a fast-growing middle class, meaning a fast-growing need for insurance. And note that people in this demographic tend to buy insurance protecting their property before they buy insurance protecting their life. So these are all kind of drivers that um, once you're, you know, you realize that we need to focus on the international um, arena, that, that we need a general insurance track. And if it were just for North America, I personally wouldn't bother with this, but we think this is critical for our international success. And our main competitor, the um, UK Actuarial Organization, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, has both life and general insurance in one credential. But keep in mind, we don't want to take over the whole world with our, with our international ambitions. Um, there are other rock-solid actuarial organizations, too, and we want to continue to collaborate with them. For example, we're a member of the North American Actuarial uh, Council, and this group has coordinated some joint research with the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. We also work within the International Actuarial Association. Uh, the IAA is a consortium of national actuarial organizations from all over the world. One good thing this group does is help produce uh, global actuarial practice notes and standards for small national actuarial organizations. Uh, another thing that the IAA does is respond to global standard setters that impact actuaries, such as IFRS and Solvency II. And um, by the way, the SOA has a um, fairly big role in all of these uh, committees that the IA puts together. We, we send a representative to all, the, all of the major committees. Um, Tanya and I were just at an IAA meeting, and I, I especially enjoyed the bilateral meetings we had with national, other national actuarial organizations, and I also sat in on some of the insurance accounting uh, committee meetings, which I have um, professional interest in. Tanya, do you want to um, talk about education? About education? Um, well, before we do that, I, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to comment on the IAA as well. Um, I, I agree with Mark. I, 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 
we, that recent meeting, I thought I got a lot of um, good information out of it. One of the most important things I think that we do when we go to these international actual associations is to sit across the table one-on-one um, -on -one with other actual organizations, like from the U.K. and Australia, for example, and kind of have a better understanding of what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve, how they're working with the IAA in achieving those goals and what their concerns are. Um, and it also gave us, me a better understanding of how other organizations are sort of viewing what the SOA is doing, and we were able to clear up a few things. I think there was a little bit of misunderstanding, for example, in what we were trying to do with the general insurance, um, trying to clarify that we aren't simply trying to increase the number of members who have an address outside of North America. We are truly trying to develop a global designation, and that is, that is what our international strategy is, is focused on. That's what we're about. So it was a really good organization. Um, a lot of, of good exchange of information, for example, with the pension group that meets there regularly and helps you understand better on a global basis your different practice areas, as you mentioned. Um, moving on now to the um, education update. Um, there's a few more things we want to talk about here. The first thing is the FSA enhancements. We're always trying to look at our education and make sure that it is meeting our members' needs and meeting the um, business world's needs. And one of the changes that we made with the FSA, we think, is moving it in the right direction because we are hearing employers are putting um, risk management, they're putting more emphasis on that throughout all areas of actual practice. So in response to that, um, we have um, added a new enterprise risk management exam. Um, they were offered this fall. Um, that was the first time they've been offered. Um, this exam is available to anyone who's seeking that chartered enterprise risk analyst credential. And this could be as a standalone credential as part of a, or as part of a fellowship track. Um, so that's an important change, and I think that's definitely moving us in the right direction as putting more emphasis on the risk management in all of our different practice areas. Also, um, just to mention, we um, in October at our board meeting, we did approve a proposal that, um, to not renew the Joint Preliminary Actual Examinations Agreement with the Casualty Actual Society, um, and that will be as of the end of 2013. Um, there have been some questions about what this means and why the decision is made. Um, first of all, we just want to assure candidates, those of you who are listening in who are taking exams, um, that the exams uh, that you plan on taking, this is not going to have an impact on you. It only affects the structure of the exams and what's happening behind the scenes regarding the administration between the SOA and the Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, other than the normal continuous updating of exam questions, um, the SOA is making no changes in the preliminary exams. Um, and they will remain available to qualifying students and candidates regardless of which path you're taking, um, whether you ultimately choose the SOA or the Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, so we have no plans also in changing our grading policy or changing our use of computer-based testing. All of that's going to continue the same. Um, the decision was just reflecting that the SOA and the CAS, um, our approach to education, are evolving. And we are trying to reflect that and make sure that it's evolving in a way that is consistent with that philosophy of the SOA's education that I talked about earlier. Um, now, finally, um, the development of the general insurance track is moving ahead as planned. Just to give you an update, everything is on track and moving ahead as planned. We've hired two staff fellows that are overseeing the development of the curriculum and material. And we've also posted those requirements for an FSA who wants to be in the GI track. Um, we posted that on SOA.org, so that is available to you. We're also planning on a campaign, if you will, to promote that general insurance track in some areas of Asia. As uh, Mark mentioned, that is why we were getting into this general insurance. We felt like that was absolutely necessary to have as one of our offerings to be able to grow our international designation. Um, so we're going to do some campaigning to make sure that people are aware of that and um, are taking advantage of the offerings that we're going to have now in the general insurance. So with that, um, I think we're done, Pat, and um, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Tanya. And I should have, um, at the beginning of the call, introduced um, Greg Heydrich, who is the executive director um, of the SOA. Um, we might call on, on Greg to um, also chime in on, on some of the questions that are coming in. And, and thanks so much. We've gotten um, several in already. And um, a few of them do deal with um, uh, the, general the new general insurance um, track. 
Um, and, and one of them, um, and, I, and I think I will start with Greg and ask him to talk about this one, um, whether uh, there is, is work underway with the American Academy of Actuaries to have the qualification standards um, updated and revised to, to reflect this new track. Greg? Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, there is a lot of work underway uh, on exactly that uh, point. In fact, I was at uh, uh, the uh, uh, NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, meeting over the weekend and at the end of last week, uh, engaged in some conversations about that. We do intend to have the uh, SOA's uh, general insurance track be recognized uh, both by regulators as well as by the American Academy of Actuaries for qualification purposes with the annual statement blank. Uh, we met with, uh, uh, during the NAIC meeting, with uh, uh, members of the uh, NAIC's Casualty Actuarial and Statistical Task Force to begin informing them about uh, the work we're doing uh, and uh, help them understand uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it and also answer any questions they have. We also gave a presentation to the Property Casualty uh, C Committee of the, of the NAIC uh, for the same purpose. Uh, we also have uh, started discussions with uh, representatives of the Academy's Committee on Qualifications uh, for the same purpose, and we'll be working with them to, uh, to uh, uh, gain uh, whatever adjustments we may need to make to the qualification standards to have this track recognized. And finally, we're engaged in conversations uh, with the Canadian Institute of Actuaries uh, for the same purpose uh, in Canada. So it is absolutely... Uh, the SOA's intent and commitment that we will be uh, we will be seeking and and ultimately gaining uh, qualification status for this track and regulatory approval, so that those uh, members who go through that path uh, will be able to sign annual statements. Thanks, Greg. And I know um, uh, we'll probably get to some other general insurance questions um, as we go along. Um, we had one question come in. Um, at following the discussion about um, the strategic plan, and Mark mentioned uh, that, that we are calling out public policy. Um, and either, either Mark or, or perhaps Tanya um, might want to talk a little bit about what we think this means for the SOA and how this um, work is intended perhaps to complement the work of in the, in the United States of the American Academy. All right, I'll get, I'll get us started, and Mark, please um, jump in and add to, to my comments, but um, the public was identified as a key stakeholder in the past iteration of the SOA strategic plan. So it's important that we have a plan that is going to figure out how we're going to meet the needs of those stakeholders based on what our general mission is as an organization. So what's new in the plan is, and let me quote this to make sure that we're, we're clear on this, the SOA's activities inform public policy development and public understanding. So initially, work in this area is going to involve developing a statement of the SOA's position on public policy strategy. That's what I talked about earlier with our initiative where we're trying to figure out exactly how we're going to approach our, um, what we feel is a need for us to leverage what we're doing at the SOA to inform public policies, but we need to define exactly how we're going to go about that. That's where we're at in this. That's our initial stage. We're developing that statement of the SOA's position on public policy. And once we get that in place, then we're going to talk about and determine how the SOA can Im implement that strategy. So, so we're still thinking through this, but overall our goal is to, um, have, um, to have an influence on forming public policy, how that's developed, and public understanding. And again, this is in response. We've heard this from more than one member that this is very important to our members, and um, we also think that we have a lot to offer in this space. So Mark, would you like to add to that? Sure, Tanya. Um, I, there, there are various aspects of public policy, and the SOA has a role in many of them, and that's what we really have to totally figure out. But, you know, some examples are, first, there's research, which is clearly the SOA's role. Um, secondly, actuaries need to educate the general public. So the, since the SOA is primarily a, um, an education and research organization, we need to take on this aspect, at least in the U.S., um, third, there are conversations with influencers, um, regulators, and lawmakers. In, in the U.S., the Academy has taken most of this responsibility, although the SOA has conversed with influencers. Um, and then there are Hill briefings. And in the U.S., while the Academy has taken a lot of this responsibility, the SOA has a role here, too, and we've taken one. Um, a recent example is uh, when the SOA presented some of our rapid retirement research. 
And, and then um, there's also testimony to policymakers and input on proposed laws and regulations. Um, this has uh, been the, the Academy's responsibility in the U.S. Um, but but it, all the, this is not all crystal clear, and there are a lot of gray areas. And you know, as, as Tanya mentioned, um, we, this is why we have this initiative in place to better define where what our role is in, in the public policy um, in public policy going forward. Right, and, and, and it is certainly our intention to coordinate with the Academy and make sure that we're doing a good job of, um, of, of being efficient with our volunteer efforts. But we do want to make sure that we have our voice in public policy as appropriate, again, to bring what the SOA has to offer to the table and, and to meet our needs. Oh, and one other thing, Tanya, I guess um, I, I'm not sure if either of us brought up, but it's not even outside the U.S., then there's an issue of... Um, what do we do there, and how do we coordinate with some of the other national actuarial organizations like the Canadian uh, Institute of Actuaries and the China Actuarial um, Association and, and whatnot? So it's not just a U.S. thing. Great, thanks. Um, in terms of um, kind of playing off the idea of, of working with other organizations, um, Tanya and Mark, can you talk a bit about um, the relationship with the um, with the Casualty Actuarial Society? Um, you know, we know that um, you know some members of the CAS had um, um, you know some concerns about the SOA developing a general insurance track, and wondered if you could talk a bit about um, how you see that relationship um, today and in the future. Okay. Good question, and certainly not the first time I've gotten that question, Pat. Um, I, I first want to say that um, both the Society of Actuaries and the Casualty Actual Society, they're both um, very strong and excellent societies, and each of these organizations are pursuing their strategies um, to promote their credentials and support their members. So, so please recognize that they're both very strong societies, both working very hard to meet their needs. Um, they're very um, understanding that the SOA offering the general insurance track has unnecessarily put us in a, a more direct competitive relationship with CAS. That does not mean that we're not collaborating with the Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, we're still looking at ways to continue to work closely with them and collaborate with them. We still have discussions. We still meet with them as part of the um, Council of U.S. Presidents and the North American um, Actuarial Council, we're still working with them in different areas, and we're also collaborating with them in um, the Joint Risk Management Section, the Enterprise Risk Management Symposium, the BeanActuary.org website. All of these um, efforts we're doing collaboratively, and um, we're also looking at collaborating in our efforts to promote diversity in the actual profession. We're working with them on the International Congress of Actuaries in 2014 in Washington, D.C. Um, we're doing coordination of positions on matters coming before the International Actuarial Association, um, the group that Mark talked about with our international strategy, the meeting that we just attended. Um, also, we're um, collaborating with research. There, there's so many different ways that we are collaborating with, with CAS, and I hope everyone understands that we have a tremendous amount of respect with each other um, across organizations, and, and I particularly do with the leaders and the members of their board. And we are hoping very much so for um, the promotion of the profession to continue all of those collaborations that I've talked about. Um, Mark, would you like to add to that? No? No, I'm good. Well, Mark, I might ask you to, um, to talk a little bit about um, the decision that, that uh, Tanya talked about during the presentation um, about ending the uh, joint administration of the preliminary exams. Um, we have had um, some people ask whether that decision is directly related to our forming the general insurance track. Can you talk to that? Sure. Um, the, the, the SOA's international strat strategy um, depends on being able to offer a general insurance track. Um, and, you know, like I said before, the the SOA believes that the growth outside of North America is going to lead to increased uh, opportunities throughout the profession. So um, being the sole administrator of its preliminary exams will allow the SOA greater flexibility and efficiencies to provide a curriculum and um, set of exams throughout the pathway. Um, you know, what, what I mean there is preliminary exams through fellowship that meet the needs of the global marketplace. 
Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on from um, general insurance and do some other issues. Uh, Tanya, when she was um, talking about some of the highlights from the board meeting, talked about uh, the new um, addition to the nominations process for um, for board roles. And a question came in that shows that there, there might be a little bit of um, confusion about the role of the nominating committee. Um, currently, the nominating committee um, puts forth two to three candidates um, uh, for um, the president-elect position. And the question is if, if that number, for instance, of people were to go through the petition process, whether the nominating committee then wouldn't um, put forward um, other candidates. Um, All right, that's a good question. Um, we want to be clear that any person who becomes a candidate for election through the petition process, um, th those are going to be in addition to, not instead of, um, those who are being selected by the nominating committee and going through that rigorous vetting process. So. They would not displace any of the potential candidates endorsed by the committee. The nominating committee still has a very critical key role. They're still coming up with their slate of candidates. Those who uh, make the ballot through petition will be in addition. So yeah, if the nominating committee endorses three candidates, for example, for president-elect, and one or two other nominees qualify for the ballot position, then there you go. There's going to be four or five candidates on the final ballot for um, our members to choose from in the election. Great, thank you very much. Um, following the discussion uh, earlier about the, um, uh, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries University Accreditation Program, uh, we've had some questions come in as to um, whether the SOA might um, at some point in the future um, adopt a similar strategy of recognizing uh, university examinations. Mark, some thoughts on that? Sure, Pat. Um, we recognize this is a, a really passionate topic for members. And know this is an important issue for us. Um, we we need to preserve the integrity of the credential. Um, and the board the board has been asked by the um, Canadian Institute of Actuaries for um, considering to recognize credit granted by the um, their university accreditation program for the SOA credential, uh, credentials. So far, the board the board has not made a decision at this point. They've made no decision at this time whether to recognize the credit or not. Um, the board does not have any plans at this time to consider providing exam credit for university um, education. If at some point in the future the board does consider um, providing exam credit for uh, university education, there will definitely be many discussions uh, with members. Thanks. Um, moving on again, Tanya, um, as a pension actuary, I'm going to um, start with you on this one, and, and maybe Mark and, uh, might have something to add to it. Um, but the public pension issue, you know, continues to uh, be um, a hot topic. Um, you know, many public pensions um, around the country are are in some um, form of crisis, um, and actuaries certainly. You know, have have a role um, in in public pension systems. Where do you think um, the SOA can play a role in um, in helping to educate the public or um, helping to somehow uh, further um, discussions to to get to eventually some sort of re resolution about uh, that that very important topic? Well, it is a really important topic, Pat. And as you mentioned, with my background in pension. Um, I, I've been following this quite closely for some time, um, and, it, and it is very troubling to see the condition that some of these public plans are and understanding the implications not just for the pensioners but for the municipalities or states that are kind of strung in or intertwined with those public plans that are funding. Um, our board has identified public plan underfunding as a key risk that could potentially negatively affect the profession because actuaries do have um, their hand in what is being calculated and determined as far as the, the funding, the pieces of the puzzle that go into funding these plans. Um, we understand that actuaries are not the ones who make the decision and write the laws as far as how these plans are funded, but they do have a role. And we want to um, look at how actuaries are practicing in that area and um, look at the risks that this might have to the profession, understanding the situation with these public plans. Um, now, for example, now during the past year, we've um, put on the, what we call the good, better, best, 
which was a call for papers and a symposium. And what this is was it brought together some public plan actuaries and trustees um, and they trying to move their current funding practices from what we see as good to maybe better and best. Uh, it was really encouraging to see what came out of that good, better, best. There were some really very good practical solutions, and more than one, I would say, that were discussed at that symposium. So it's definitely moving the practice in the right direction and looking for ways to go from that good status to better or best. Um, it's not just the SOA that's looking at this. We also have the Council of U.S. Presidents that's been discussing the situation and the implications for the profession. And we are also discussing, um, we, the SOA, have been talking with the actual standards board, who is also aware of this issue and is looking at the way that we set our standards and what requirements are in our standards to understand how we can better support actuaries working in the public plan space. Um, so those are some of the things that we're looking at, but we are concerned about it. We want to make sure as an organization that we are best supporting our members who are practicing in the public plan space and that, that they have the right standards and support and research and everything else that we can give them to, to help them understand how to, to go to that best practices in, this, in the public plan arena. And um, you can look for us um, in 2013. Um, you'll probably be hearing more efforts from the SOA to kind of get our arms around this and, again, better support the actuaries in the public plans area. Thanks, Tanya. Um, we've had some questions, or one question mark come in um, regarding the uh, idea about consolidating the profession in North America. I um, wondered if you could provide an update on that. Sure, Pat. Um, as, as you're probably aware, the, the SOA thought consolidation was a good idea for two main reasons. The first relates to our international strategy, and uh, you know, I talked about that earlier. We think it's critical to offer general insurance to that market, so we thought the fastest way of getting there would be to consolidate with the uh, Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, secondly, in, in the U.S., we sometimes trip around um, exactly what our role is versus the Academy's role. And, and, you know, like Tanya said before, that's why we're coming up with a strategic initiative to try to figure out exactly where we play. Um, and I'm sure the Casualty Actuarial Society has a similar issue. Um, we, we tried to, we tried to um, consolidate, and the Casualty Actuarial Society rejected the idea. So with, without them, it's difficult for the Academy of Actuaries to consolidate, so basically the idea died. Um, instead, these, these organizations, along with the Conference of Actuaries and ACOPA, which is the Pension Actuarial Association, we all formed a task force to examine the optimal structure of the profession in the U.S. Um, Sue Collins and I represented the SOA on that task force, uh, and that task force's report was completed last summer, and that's available to the public. Um, since most of the members of this task force were not representatives of the SOA, um, this task force quickly rejected consolidation, but it did suggest that there might be some low-hanging fruit that we should consider consolidating, just like we did recently with um, the Joint Discipline Committee, um, possibly things like continuing education requirements. Um, the, the other recommendation was a suggestion to establish a strategic planning process for the U.S. profession in its entirety. And obviously this um, latter idea is easier said than done. Um, yeah, that, that strategic planning process, I mean, you know, Mark, from working on the SOA strategic plan, that that is no small deal, and doing that on a profession-wide basis um, could get quite complex, but I do feel like that's really important, and I really like the finding that came out in that report. Um, I continue to say I know we have all these different organizations and it's a necessary status, and it's probably going to be that way for a while. We're just not moving into consolidation. But we still have a single profession, and we need to do a better job of presenting ourselves as a single profession and going out to all the different businesses and stakeholders and coordinating how we're going about promoting the profession and our different pr and getting our perspectives heard out there, I think that's something that's really doing us no favors as a profession. So I really like the idea of coming out with that strategy. I think that's something 
that um, the, the cusp can work on and um, other groups can kind of see how we can go forward. Um, I don't see it as putting a different additional layer of bureaucracy as much as just trying to do a better job of coordinating and making sure that we have a better single voice as a profession. And um, so I'm really excited about that, and I hope we get some legs under that. That's something I want to work on in 2013. Great, thanks. Um, a point of um, uh, clarification, Tanya, when uh, you were talking about um, the the new um, nominations process um, w in terms of the the petition issue, um, it, the question is is whether it's going to be clear which candidates were vetted by the nominating committee and which came are, are on the ballot through the petition process. That's a very good question. That was one of my first questions I had when this proposal came to the board, and the answer is yes. You will be able to identify those who um, gained their spot on the ballot because they went through that rigorous process we keep talking about with the nominating committee um, to make sure that they met all the qualifications, experience, et cetera, versus those who were um, went through the petition process and had a sufficient number of members who support them being on the ballot. So it will be very clear and designated on the ballot, and you'll know who is who. So when you get that list of 5 to 20, I don't know how many, you'll know um, who the nominating committee um, recommended and who also went through the petition process. Thanks. Um, question um, that I'm actually going to ask Greg to um, to start off with, and, and uh, maybe there will be um, some discussion about it. Um, the, the increase in the uh, frequency of the preliminary exams um, you know, is probably a very much a positive for the candidates, um, but might make it a little more difficult for employers to administer exam standards um, and to get their employees to continue to be productive as they're, as they're going through the um, exam process. Um, does the SOA have any thoughts on, on how it might um, uh, try to, to help manage that situation? Well, it uh, certainly, uh, certainly, uh, uh, the increase in the number of preliminary exam offerings has been a big benefit uh, to candidates. Uh, as you know, at the earliest exams, we're offering those uh, six times a year, so every couple of months. Uh, some of the other early exams are four times a year, and that has been a tremendous help uh, to our candidates as they as they work with this and prepare for it. Uh, they do have to work closely with their employers to make sure that they're uh, meeting both of their objectives, uh, preparing for the examinations, as well as doing good work uh, uh, with their employers. Uh, I do think, and this is one where Tanya and uh, and Mark may want to add some comments. We are uh, Mark mentioned uh, uh, in the uh, preliminary uh, discussion about the new candidate engagement uh, program that we're putting in place, and that's really intended to provide information to candidates to help them understand how best to study, how best to prepare. Uh, for the work that they're doing, Tanya, I think had some comments about that as well in the in the uh, preliminary uh, preliminary uh, discussion, and I think that may help uh, both employers and candidates as we go forward. But but clearly, the frequent exam uh, offerings is a major benefit for candidates uh, in their preparation uh, for these uh, very difficult exams. Tanya, do you want to add some uh, comments on that one? Yeah, I'll I'll just say um as remembering my days as a student and trying to retain information for, let's just hypothetically propose that maybe I didn't pass an exam and that I had to retake it. And if that took a year before I it was offered again. I thought you told me you passed all your exams the first time. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> but just proposing if that possibly happened, trying to retain that information for a year and understanding that there will be curriculum changes from one year to the next, um, I, I, to me, is one of the, the best things we've done um, in addition to having the um, electronic delivery of examinations, one of the best things we've done is to offer those exams. I do also, as being a manager of students taking exams, I understand that it can be a burden to try to work around students who are playing, who are um, taking exams. But I, I kind of put that back a little bit to the employers that they need to structure their exam programs in the way they're supporting their students to kind of recognize that we're doing this, I think ultimately we're going to end up in the right place, that people are able to take those exams over in a much quicker amount of time if they aren't successful. Um, but yeah, there may be some adjustments that you need to make in how you're supporting your students and, and adjustments to your program. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I've had a question come in um, that I think I will um, pitch to the to Mark as, as a former um, treasurer of the SOA. 
Um, I know one of the things that um, that you look at is is pricing of of continuing education, um, and a question came in for for a retiree wondering if uh, there could be reduced pricing for um, continuing education for retirees. Yeah, thanks, Pat. And I, I've heard that question also for um, sole practitioners too. That uh, some have asked me that, and I, that. We did look at this very recently. The Professional Development Committee and the Finance Committee um, last looked at the pricing of our um, of all our professional development events, including webinars, uh, back in 2011. And that pricing just got implemented this year. So at, at that point, we moved from a fairly complicated three-tier structure to a two-tier structure um, because of large employer cost concerns. Um, and, and the fact that it was three tiers was just way more complicated than it had to be. Uh, since that change, we've had very little negative reaction, and um, we do note that the average margin, the, the profit margin per uh, web, uh, webinar, has declined. So, you know, in any case, we're we're going to keep this fee structure in place. It's only been in place less than a year, so. I don't think that we're going to next review this thing until late 2013 or early 2014, but you know we will consider it again. And um, as we consider requests for fee reductions, we need to consider our pricing strategy for all professional development, um, look at competitor pricing, and balance uh, decreases with other increases or, or cost decreases. And just a thought, uh, this is Greg, just a thought uh, to add to Mark's. Uh, the PD, the Professional Development Committee, is uh, looking, is always looking at uh, pricing. And uh, one of the things that they're mindful of, and we have to be mindful of in the organization, is to make sure that, the, that our uh, PD programs uh, do provide revenues to cover their costs and, and on occasion to provide uh, some net revenue. Otherwise, uh, we just put pressure, revenue pressure on the dues uh, where we've been able to keep uh, the membership dues level the same for the past seven years, uh, and on our basic education level. Those are the uh, the three revenue sources that the society has, professional development events, uh, uh, our examination fees, uh, and our member dues. So uh, reducing one uh, necessarily puts some pressure on the other. So it is a, it's always a balancing act, and it's something that the Finance Committee uh, that Mark has worked with, uh, 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 Tanya serves on that, and the Professional Development Committee do look at carefully all the time. Great. We have um, received a few more questions um, regarding uh, the general insurance track, um, and one is about um, the the hours um, within within the new uh, fellowship track. Greg, why why does the um, the GI fellowship track have two more hours of exams than uh, than the other FSA tracks? Um, it's really intended to meet uh, or necessary to meet regulatory requirements. Uh, it will have a and regulatory expectations. Uh, uh, the uh, GI track will have a, a separate examination or special examination, an introduction to general insurance concepts. Uh, this is something that regulators want to see. It's something that the academy, I believe, will want to see. Uh, given that that's what they've seen uh, from other other providers, principally the CAS over the years, and what they feel is necessary. Um, there's a lot of uh, critical concepts, unique insurance coverage information that a candidate needs to understand in order to be effective in this area. Uh, so we will have that, uh, that uh, additional examination that people who go through that track will need to pursue. That's frankly uh, similar to what happens in the retirement track today where candidates who move through that path need to take the EA examination in order to get that, uh, to get that authority and that approval. So it is a difference with that examination and uh, something we're working to prepare right now. Yeah, so essentially our examinations is going to meet that philosophy that I talked about um, when we were talking about how we are delivering our education to our potential, to our candidates, and so it's going to meet that layer and then also add on the regulatory requirements as it does in the retirement space now. Well, Tanya, building off that um, a bit, um, someone asked the question, um, you know, kind of it all taken together, as we've talked about uh, the new GI track and, and the curriculum that, that's going to go into it and, and how the SOA is intending to, um, to train actuaries in that area. Why would you tell someone that they should consider choosing the SOA over, say, the, in, in the United States, the CAS, but um, in, in Asia, perhaps uh, the, the UK system? 
A great question. And again, not the first time I've gotten that question. Um, but I think there's going to be some really excellent reasons to choose the SOA track. Um, first of all, the FSA is the strongest actual brand in the world. Global, people want that. And, and it is a global credential. We said we're developing into it. It already is. It's already an international global credential. So if you have that FSA and general insurance, that's going to translate to different parts of the world because people know what an FSA is and they're going to understand that um, and they're going to have and they're going to value that and also um, the candidate can also have a little more time to decide what specialty they're going into the way that our exams are structured you kind of veer off into that path of your specialty a little bit later in the examination process so it gives people that flexibility um, we're also um, you will have more flexibility as far as if let's say you start down the casualty track and you decide that you also want to have some good experience maybe in health or some other area. You can get your casualty FSA, but you can also have um, maybe a minor, if you will, or some sort of additional information in the other tracks because you have that basis of learning in the SOA track and then you're building on to get into different specialties. So you're not restricted. You've already got that base and you can move into different directions. So I think the flexibility is going to be really nice. Um, also, um, again, just going back to that international presence, I think that's probably going to be one of the biggest selling points, at least initially, is that when you have that FSA in general insurance, you have a designation that people don't just understand and appreciate in North America, but they're going to understand and appreciate that in Asia. And we're going out and we're going to be marketing this credential. We're going to make sure people understand it and um, understand that it is going through that same philosophy and rigor that we have for our other disciplines, and it's going to be a top-of-the-line designation. Um, again, the FSA is the strongest actual brand in the world. People want that, and they're going to want this um, FSA GI track, too. Thanks, Tanya. And um, one last question. I think we're running up to um, the end of our time. Um, as we talk about expanding into what is a new area for the SOA, um, a question mark about expanding into um, other areas, some you know that are considered in the more non-traditional areas. It's something that we've talked about at the SOA for a while. Um, as an important initiative for, for the SOA. Can you talk about what's happening um, currently? Sure, Pat. Um, back in mid-2012, we appointed a task force to uh, focus on opportunities in the financial services sector since uh, this was adjacent to the traditional work of actuaries. Uh, the, the task force is completing its initial work, and they'll be making recommendations on how the SOA can address opportunities. Uh, this task force will also offer insights into what other tr non-traditional areas should be explored. At the same time, we considered this issue so important that we established a more general strategic initiative that's sort of an umbrella over this, uh, which will consider all expansion into um, non-traditional roles and markets. And uh, Tanya had talked a little bit about that back when she was talking about the um, 2013 strategic initiatives. Great. Well, thank you both very much. We have come to the end of our time um, for today. Uh, I'd like to thank um, all the members and, and candidates and others who um, uh, dialed in for this session. Um, and, of course, thanks to uh, Tanya and Mark for your leadership, um, as well as Greg uh, for participating in this um, webinar. You will receive a short evaluation survey at the end, and we, as I said earlier, we do welcome your comments and feedback as we continue to look for opportunities to enhance our dialogue with our members. So thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a great day.